afternoon. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joining us for this hybrid event. I'm Miriam Stark, and I'm currently the director for the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we're very pleased that we have both live options and streaming options, um, later recorded options here for our speakers this semester. And today, we're very lucky to have Emeritus Professor Dr. Ricardo Tremilios, and he uh, has had stints in the music department, but I think of him as the Asian Studies faculty, and today he's a friend of everyone, including the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And so he's gonna speak on prescriptive maleness, femaleness, performative masculinity, femininity, and modes of heteronormativity, homonormativity embodied in Philippine music and dance. And it's our great pleasure to honor him. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tremilio. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, Lorenzo was supposed to come to introduce me, so he can introduce me at the end. He can tell me who I am and what you've heard. I'm very happy to be here and uh, welcome also to all of you online. I also wish to thank the Center for Southeast Asian Studies for the invitation to participate in this talk series and also thank its staff. Uh, including Terry Skilton, uh, for their assistance. I give special thanks also to Juni Chow for editing the sound and video materials. I can't see whether, okay, it should go to preliminary comments. I can't see what the slide has changed or not, so it's a little bit hard. So, okay, so the slide should be preliminary comments. <laughs> I view public performances as occasions to reinforce and critique societal processes reflected in the three sets of binaries of my title, maleness, femaleness, masculinity, femininity, and heteronormativity, homonormativity. I use the term gender to reference them, although I do so with some reservation because of its North Atlantic cultural baggage. I begin, however, with a brief explanation of how I view each pair. Uh, first, prescriptive maleness and femaleness. These are the expectations of how a male or female in the Philippines is supposed to act as presented and represented in performance. The pair constitutes idealized models. Like idealized models in any social domain, they are not always realized or adhered to, particularly in the Philippine setting. Second, performative masculinity and femininity. These encompass a range and diversity of behaviors or strategies manifested in performance. Some of these behaviors reference the model, some critique it, while others may subvert it. We will return to this point later. And third, modes of heteronormativity or homonormativity. Some of you think, finally, we get to sex. <laughs> Not entirely. Heteronormativity denotes mixed male and female activity, whether social, religious, political, or sexual. Homonormativity denotes some, some same-sex activity, whether social, religious, political, or sexual, and regardless of gender identity or gender identification. As ethnomusicologists, I find that performance or expressive culture provides a nuanced image of social expectations that can differ from images transmitted uh, through discursive speech or, the, or uh, the prescriptive written word. Songs of the vernacular are such instances. Of special significance are those composed during the early wave of Filipino nationalism at the end of Spanish rule and before the full realization that the American presence was another colonial period, though couched in benevolent terms. Self-conscious reflection on being Filipino was to be found in such sophisticated operetta entertainments as the Sarsuela and in individually composed vernacular songs. These found much popular popularity among the bourgeois, the bourgeois music making, which also created thriving industries of published sheet music, sales of the upright piano and instrument building. The performance of music and dance, by the way, which I continue, consider a, a single unit music and dance, constitutes an intentional social statement that assumes consensus. The performances just discussed here are intended for an other, however defined. Uh, first, it is the social interaction between those who perform and those who watch. 
Second, in Filipino performance, boundaries between performer and observer, that is the audience, are not a fixed status. They can be a fluid series of positionalities. Third, there are kinds of observers, the intentional observer, the opportunistic observer, and the clandestine observer. We'll be showing to that. And there are different kinds of performers, the rehearsed performer, the spontaneous performer, and the rehearsed spontaneous performer. I feel that these same features can be relevant to the performativity of gender. Performance simultaneously embodies and informs the three binaries separately and in combination. I suggest that the performance of music and dance manifests significant relationships with identity, including ethnicity and class, as well as gender. We commence with the first pair, prescriptive femaleness and maleness, and the slide should say prescriptive femaleness and maleness. I present two examples from two different parts of the Philippines. The first, Angdalaga and Filipina, comes from the majority lowland Tagalog north, and the second, Abdullah Ibn Putri Isara, from the minority and Muslim Tausug South. The two suggest that idealized expectations of maleness and femaleness are pan-Philippine. As ethnomusicologists, I find that the performance of expressive culture provides a nuanced image of social expectations that can differ from images transmitted through discursive speech or the prescriptive written word. Songs of the vernacular are therefore rich resources, both semantically and musically. Of special significance for this discussion are those composed during the early wave of Filipino nationalism at the end of the Spanish rule. Uh, Self-conscious reflection on being Filipino was to be found in such sophisticated uh, uh, entertainments as Sarsuela, as I already said, and vernacular songs such as Muchi Nang Pasi, Nasa Anke Irok, and Sarong Bangi. A number of songs are prescriptive of the Filipino woman. One is the composed urban balitao, Ang Dalagang Pilipina, the Filipino woman, by Jose Santos upon a text by Jose Corazon de Jesus, which is a double male gaze. Angdalagan Filipina articulates a structural and idealized image of the Filipino woman. And you should see now this slide, Angdalagan Filipina. And in the English translation, if you look through it, it says the Filipino woman is like a star in the morning who makes you happy. She is unique, uh, has she a unique glow and a lustrous beauty. And more importantly, she's becoming in her actions, becoming in her movement that is uh, uh, attractive, tender, modest, and coy. And again, we'll come back to that. Uh, the second part, which is the bridge in the music is, a heart is pure that turns to love with a lasting and unswerving dedication. So it's not only purity, it's love and loyalty. And we'll come back to that. And then you can read the last part. Uh, in this song, the Filipina woman is praised from afar for her physical beauty, her non-confrontational demeanor, and her social sensitivity. Such sentiments could be discussed, sorry, could be dismissed today as a vestige of 19th century Hispanic colonial machismo. However, the fact is that they are still articulated in contemporary society. The song on the Lago Filipina is frequently performed in concerts, a fact that reinforces the image. Furthermore, it is used in commercial films, short stories, and television programs. One result, unfortunately, is the globalization of the stereotype generating the infamous mail order bride industry. Significantly, the song title suggests it is only prescribing femaleness, but there is a second verse that does not appear in the title and is rarely sung that relates to maleness, particularly as part of the nation. The slide is Ang Binatang Filipino. If you look at this, the Filipino man is the true wealth of my country, nationalistic, renowned for his virtue and courage. He is intelligent, moderate, respectful, honest, and true to his duty, again, loyalty. Again, the bridge is almost the same, pure in the ways of love and lasting and swerving dedication, loyalty again. And then uh, you can look at the, the third part of the song of some of his other uh, qualities. 
but it ends as the one did not with the wealth and honor of my chosen country. Again, uh, a nationalistic and, and belonging to the nation. Tying in masculinity to service to the nation, the text presents a catalog of masculine pancadalake traits, that is ma masculine traits, virtue, courage, intelligence, respectfulness, honesty, and conscientiousness, which constitute qualities of heteronormative masculinity. Notably, both genders, that is the fem femaleness and maleness are age graded because the term dalaga uh, is the term for a young and usually virginal young woman, because the other term for just female would be babae. And the other term, binata, for a man, uh, uh, describes or refers to a younger man, not necessarily virgil, but a younger man, because the other uh, term for men in general, or man in general, is lalake. So, it has a specific age grading to it, which shows promise. And in other uh, uh, presentations, I go into much more detail about the idea of promise with these two words. Uh, let's go on to the third next slide. Uh, notably, uh, in the music, the shared qualities of a pure heart and the ability to love this bridge are ascribed to both females and maleness. And not only that, they occur at the same structural position in the music. So this shows uh, a relationship between the sonic construction and the, um, and the text construction and the value construction. Now, the second example comes from the Taosug of the Southern Philippines and is an epic story genre called Vyanghit Parangsabi. It depicts a robust maleness, but with the same quality of a pure heart and ability to love. However, the narrative is more violent. The epic is the Parang Sabiel Abdullah Ivan Putli Isara, Abdullah and the esteemed Sa Isara. Parang Sabiel, uh, in Arabic, Sabiel Ila, is path of God and is the notorious ritual suicide um, in which the Tausuk slashed non believers, usually uh, Spanish or American groups, until the, the, the Tausuk himself was killed. The practice was feared as juramentado by the Spanish and uh, amok by the Americans who reportedly developed the Colt 45 pistol to guard against it. This Parang Sabil recitation takes two to three hours and is part of an all night performance of music with gabang, that is xylophone accompaniment. Manifesting both agency and empowerment, it is the story of vengeance of a betrothed Muslim couple during the Spanish occupation of Holo Town, 1876 to 1899. I take some time here to outline the story because of the various levels of gen gender interaction explicit in it. Briefly, Abdullah and Isara are affianced. A Spanish lieutenant in Holo compromises Isara's honor during a chance encounter while she is bathing in the river, which she was warned by her father not to do because of modesty. However, Abdullah must defend her honor. Blood revenge is visited upon the lieutenant and the Spanish garrison by both Abdullah and Pudi Isara, who die at Spanish hands as a double suicide. The Panglima, father of Isara, refuses to claim her body because she divided, defied his authority. Their deaths are then avenged by Isara's mother as a third Parangsadi, who dies at the hands of the Spanish. The pre-adolescent brother of Isara resolves to avenge his sister and mother through a fourth Parang Sabiel. However, at the close of the narrative, in a not unfamiliar twist of Deus Ex Machina, <laughs> the boy is adopted by the captain of the garrison and presumably grows up Castilla, that is, as a Spaniard. How is masculinity modeled in the narrative? Abdullah, as protagonist, is central. I cite four aspects, physical appearance, weaponry, individual behavior, and social obligations. First, to physical appearance. The protagonist's appellation is Abdullah Linkatan, handsome Abdullah. The adjective stem Linkat can also describe an attractive female, such as Ibujang Malinkat, the beautiful young maiden. Thus, attractiveness of the Linkat variety can be either masculine or feminine. 
In discussions, some say that the stem linkat as handsome connotes refined features, a calm demeanor, and a life with strong body. Others add that linkat for males can also imply the, pheno the phenotype Arab or Arab, that is light complexion and a high nose, paralleling lowland Filipino notions of mestizo as handsome. Another word for handsome is madurug, which connotes a more muscular handsomeness, a sturdier body type, and interestingly, often a darker complexion. Thus, modeling for physical desirability recalls Javanese notions of halus and gaga, uh, that is refined and robust, and also Chinese notions of refined wen and robust wu, male attractiveness. In the next slide, it shows that further masculinity is marked by iconic objects, in this case, the bladed weapon. Preparing for Farangzavil, Abdullah straps on a kris or kadis, the wavy bladed weapon that marks masculine identity. In the story, uh, his fiance also puts on a bladed weapon, but it is a barong, which is not as uh, high status as the kris. Model masculinity is embedded in actions of the narrative. Um, Abdullah is respectful to the Panglima, his future father-in-law, and informs him, him not to fiance Isara, that he must leave for Sandakan, as you saw in the first verse. Such intergenerational and homosocial interaction is appropriate and expected. Another trait depicted is self-control, that is avoiding external display of emotion. After learning that his fiance has been compromised, Abdullah says in, in, uh, in the uh, in narration, quote, even if unable to control my great grief, I press it to my chest, that is, hold it inside, unquote. Abdullah's ultimate self-control is at the moment of his death. After killing a number of soldiers, he then falls upon, uh, sorry, uh, he disengages his chris, throws up his hands, and announces that he will fight no more. He then falls upon the corpse of his already dead fiance in a final gesture of protection. This act references a number of modeled masculine traits, concern for family honor, deep religious conviction, and an acceptance of ultimate self-sacrifice, that is death. This example is also an opportunity to comment on sonic aspects, the music itself. In this genre, uh, that is Yankit Parang Sabil, the voice is not gendered. Males and females in Bantut, these are the feminized males equivalent to the Tagalog Bakla and the Bisayan Agi, all sing in the same vocal range. Let's listen to an example of, this is a male, this is a masculine male, uh, uh, singing uh, the opening verse uh, to this very, very long uh, epic. And you will hear it at first that he sings sort of what we call um, in free rhythm, and then goes to a rhythmic part accompanied by a xylophone called gabang. And this is an opening uh, salutation in which he invokes uh, the blessing of God. However, in other Filipino performances, voice is gender. The illustration represents vocal characterization from the 1996 by The musical portrays the life of Jose Rizal, the national hero of the Philippines. The two examples reference the execution that is death by the colonial Spanish for sedition because of his advocacy for Philippine independence. 
next slide should show gendering the voice female. The first, the end, this first example is the end of the moving soliloquy by his mother, Theodora, after he has been, after Rizal has been sentenced to death. She cries out for no more suffering and no more tragedy and ends with the uh, final words, for my son. And this is very significant for Filipino value systems. The relationship of the mother to the son is extremely important. Uh, and uh, again, in other presentations, I uh, develop this more. The female voice that is uh, gendering the voice here approaches an almost torch song quality using uh, her lower range and a dark timbre that portrays both gender and age. This is the mother of uh, Jose Rizal. And you can hear this in the, in the way in which the voice cracks sort of at the end. And as I say, the last words you hear are Anako, my son. We have the example. Also, very repeating, but we haven't got time. Uh, the, the next example uh, is gendering the voice as a male. Uh, uh, and this also comes from the last act of the, of, of the play. As Riva, uh, Jose Rizal faces his execu as execution, he co composes the famous poem, Mi Ultimo Adios, that is, My Final Farewell which is known by every Filipino pupil, either in the original Spanish, but certainly in the Tagalog translation. In the final act, he sings it, the, of the musical, he sings it in the original Spanish. The excerpt uh, that you will hear is the first stanza. The voice quality for this hero is a light, pop quality baritone, which contrasts with the tenor as hero in most Western musicals or operas. At the very end, uh, before I, it, it cut it off in the editing, you will hear a female begin to sing the Tagalog translation of this first verse. And so the, your, the word you will hear is Paala, which means farewell. Also gendered, that voice singing in Tagalog, that is the female voice, uh, the white word you will hear, is supposed to represent Inang Pilipinas, that is mother Philippines. Again, this idea of the, uh, the nation. Um, Let's hear this uh, example. Adios patria dorada, reyon del sol querida, perla del mar de oriente, nuestro perdido Edén. A darte voy alegre, la triste mustia vida. Si fuera más brillante, más fresca, más florida, también por ti la diera, la diera por tu bien. Adiós, patria. Ah, you cut off the last word. Could we play it again? You just have to hear that paalam. Well, the Filipinos get to hear it again. Hear it first. voy alegre, la triste mustia vida. 
si fuera más brillante, más fresca, más florida, también por ti la tierra, la tierra por tu bien. Bien, bien, bien. Going on to uh, the next slide, in heteronormative spaces, such as a party or a theater, performance can reinforce heteronormative masculinity and femininity. The first example is part of the, is of except from the folk dance, Cariñosa, in which proper behavior avoids physical contact between male and female by using various gestures of modesty and purity. The dance figures show the use of the fan to both ward off and encourage attentions of the male, the use of the handkerchief as a kind of hide and seek, and the chase in which the female is pursued by the male, but then reverses roles and pursues the male. There are many more figures, but we're only seeing us looking at three. Uh, notice, I can't see the video, but I'm uh, assuming you can, that uh, the male is wearing the national Barong Tagalog dress, and the female is wearing a period costume called the Maria Clara with a full skirt. Uh, it could be played in the video. Notice, that, notice there is some uh, sort of gender symmetry here that uh, the male does something that is considered masculine, but then the female turns around and does uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, the next slide uh, shows um, uh, a, an instance in which uh, a femininity can be a critique. A female agency can critique gender and take control as the improvised Letenio folk balita, which is different from the urban balita that we heard uh, uh, earlier, called the title is Smiling. And this is from the English loan word, smiling. And it, it illustrates this. Okay, if we, um, the next uh, slide should show the, um, uh, the text. Uh, and in, as you can see here in this text, in this case, the text refers to the sensitive topic of male sexual performance. The musical structure provides two modes of female control. The relentless strophic form, this is the, the musical form, it's a same melody repeated over and over again, colors the semantic content as it unfolds. The innocuous melody heightens the dramatic effect, surprise or shock, when the female introduces the final word of the stanza, sagging, which means banana, clearly a phallic reference. So listen for the word sagging and we can all smile together. Beautiful. Bisan ka gadi doi maguro i smiling ka dini diri ka hita ka sing ka sing andini diri an hita ka sing ka sing ka di ka mara magtanum hin saging <laughs> Maaram gada ku magtanum hin Saging piru waray Bunga purus lasa ring sing Okay, the triple meter exerts real-time pressure upon the band. Each of his verses must respond to the content of the foregoing female stanza and must commence after the very next downbeat of the waltz meter. 
you must improvise a verse that is minimally sensible or optimally clever within three beats following the final word of the female singer. Thus, the female controls both the subject matter and the possible responses by the male. Uh, the next slide, uh, femininity of subversion. The dialoguing Filipina model can be subverted. In the classic novelty song, Balot uh, uh, shows this. Balot is the infamous unhatched duck egg that putatively enhances male sexual performance. We are getting to sex. <laughs> Sung by the famed vaudeville performer, Katie Dela Cruz, the text contests the expectations of, uh, um, of uh, sorry, of the tender, the modest, and the coy of Angalagan Filipina. And also, Dela Cruz's delivery with her uh, uh, sort of signature guttural growl further adds to its subversive effects. Uh, let's listen to the example. Itong balot ay mainam na gamot sa mga taong laging nag-iing. Okay, so let's go on to the next sort of topic is um, homot uh, homonormativity in, uh, in heterosexual settings. Um, now, when we turn uh, to homonormativity in heterosexual context, uh, a very good example of this is the Holy Week enactment of the Passion of Christ. Now, to remind you, homonormativity identifies any social activity that is exclusively same sex, regardless of gender identity or sexuality. In Bicol, one of the more charming uh, enactments of the Last Supper includes the trick of representing halos on the disciples with lit candles balanced on each head, which they have to keep on during the entire of the part of the Last Supper. Of course, in the Orthodox narrative, that is the, the, the church narrative, the disciples would not have had halos yet because uh, Ascension and Pentecost has not yet occurred. In any case, the enactment is homonormatively male. There is no Mary Magdalene, and all the actors as well as characters are male. Uh, in the next example, homonort of uh, normativity in heterosexual spaces is in dance. Many local folk dance, uh, lowland folk dances represent homonormativity within the heterosexual milieu, such as in a rural fiesta or as seen here, presented on an international stage by the national dance company Bayanian. Again, a topic which I could go on for days. The dancer, the dancers, all male, strap coconut shells to strategic parts of their bodies that are rhythmically struck with, with virtuosity. Unlike the heteronormative cariñosa, which we saw, the homonormative maglalitic choreography includes dancers touching each other's bodies, or at least touching their coconuts. <laughs> Same-sex touching is largely considered normative and non-sexual in the Philippines. I'll, let me say that again. Same-sex touching is largely considered normative and non-sexual in the Philippines, although this is changing due to globalization and westernization. In most performances of Maglalitik, the dancers are bare-chested, which intensifies various gendered gazes and desires of the on the masculine body. In the international this international context, the dancers dance with covered upper torso, and there's also a story to that. Let's look at the example. <laughs>
Um, um, um. Musical instruments as objects in their material static state can also be gendered. The nose flute uh, in the Cordillera is played, for example, only by males. One of its major functions is for courting, which is a great example of a performance whose the audience observers include the intentional, that is the object of the courting activity, and the opportunistic, the, or the female, that is the family members and neighbors who may also be listening. Uh, with this function, the instrument carries gendered associations of propagation, family lineage, and heteronormativity through intergenerational production, that is the case of having children. Uh, the photo is of Benny Sokong, one of the leading international figures of Cordillera culture, which is also relevant. In traditional Bahag and with torso bared, he also reflects the gendered masculine Filipino body, which we shall return to in a moment. Going on to the next slide, uh, religious practice uh, is heteronormative uh, in its origins. Uh, although in this case, homosexual in its, uh, in its setting. Part of this um, uh, celebration is of the Santa Cruzan is uh, uh, remembering the discovery or celebrating the discovery of the true Holy Cross by Saint Helen, that is Santa Elena and her son, Emperor Constantine, again, the mother son relationship. The celebration features a procession of beautifully, beautifully attired young women each representing a reina, a queen, or a princess from various kingdoms, some actual, some historical, and some fictitious. This is in the smaller photograph to your right. Feminized males, the so-called bakla, also pro process as princesses and queens with male escorts. That's a large uh, uh, photograph. Thus, feminized homosexual males are part of heteronormative religious traditions in the Philippines, a kind of gender mimicry. <clears throat> the photo shows male Santa Cruz and Queen Migoy, that is her drag name, in, in, in BGV, those of you who know that is Bonifacio Global Village in the Philippines, sponsored by the gay club called Nectar. She is a transnational Filipina who actually works in Dubai in finance. She, she was able to come home for Holy Week because it coincides with the Muslim observance of Ramadan in Dubai. The putatively straight male escort wears traditional formal and national male attire of the Parang Tagalog. So this is a very heteronormative setting, a female with her male escort. The next slide. The beauty contests in this protocols are essentially a heteronormative institution. Unlike the female, the feminized male bakla beauty pageants, the gay male beauty pageant con uh, contest directs the male gaze to the male gendered body and the male gaze may be either uh, gay or straight. The gay masculine body pictured here is Joel Carcassona, a jazz dancer who competed in the national contest as Mr. Gay Cebu. And those of us who are Visayans are very proud. Uh, his day job is in finance, although he also trained as a nurse. Again, very important in terms of modern Filipino gendering. As object of desire, there is no discernible difference between the gay masculine body of Cartasona and in the small paragraph, uh, small photo, the straight masculine body uh, of former film star Isco Moreno, also known as Francisco Dumagoso, who was uh, mayor of, of Manila until 2022. He also was a star in what, what were called bold movies, which were slightly pornographic. In comparison, we compare the two, and if you remember uh, what uh, Benny Sokong looks like, both are trim, but not ripped. That is, they're not hyper-masculine. Both show little body hair, both are light skins, and both have narrow mestizo noses. Thus, there appears to be a single physical type that is normative both for the gay gaze and the straight gaze. <laughs> I suggest that this physical type parallels desirable masculine bodies found throughout Southeast Asia. You think of Thai bodies, uh, Indonesian bodies. How societal gender expectations are played out in performance has been a long-term but marginal interest for me. 
Uh, my career interest has been more tied to issues of ethnic identity, notions of cultural tradition, and the structural organization of sonic materialism music and the kinetic and visual materialism dance. This talk then has been an opportunity to share some of my musings concerning this secondary interest. We should be at the conclusion slide. Its diachronic consideration of gendering in the Philippines problematizes the Western binary of heterosexual and homosexual as a deductive template for understanding gender performativity in the Philippines. This informal intervention today constitutes a call for other epistemologies and, and positionalities. The North Atlantic binary ignores the reality that in the Philippines, heteronormative and homonormative are both normative. And it further masks such qualities as the sensual and the tactile, which are foundational to the vibrancy and to the appeal of Filipinoness. Uh, this has been a whirlwind excursion of expectations and strategic realizations of an array of gendered behaviors in an admittedly historical Philippine space. Through such forays, I continue to uncover and discover the richness and complexities of Filipino gendering. For me, this exercise leads me to the following conclusions, which I share with you. First, each binary, maleness, femaleness, masculinity, femininity, and heteronormativity, homonormativity, function independently of, as well as in combination with one another in complex, complicated, and complicating ways. Second, as I already said, heteronormativity and homonormativity are both normative. Third, the notions and politics of gender from the Atlantic North are increasingly invoked in the Philippines exacerbated by the increased circulation of transnationals and heritage to Filipinos like myself, both virtually and in person. Fourth, these combinations and singularities encountered in Filipino public and institutional spaces raise questions about degrees of efficacy and usefulness of Western notions of gender for an imagined and performed Filipinicity. Fifth, these binaries and their concomitant dynamics suggest tantalizing evidence of a deep indigenous sensibility that ties the Philippines to broader cultural and ontological streams of Southeast Asia. And finally, these three binaries are foundational to what Filipinos invoke as traditional, as traditional and constitute a subtext for claims of distinctiveness, if not exceptionalism. Filtering out competing concepts of gender and sexuality arising from globalization, diasporic populations, and transnational circulations may reveal a holistic and internally coherent system of who we are. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to discussion and critique. We have the last slide. So at this moment, I would like to introduce my former student and the person who is going to introduce me for the discussion, Lorenzo Murillo. So, um, the camera's there, just look. Um, okay, so I think that. Um, I'd like to first start off with maybe I'll start off with a question and I can open up to the audience. Um, I think it was a great, um, wonderful presentation with plenty to think about. Um, and one of the things that it really does make me think to is some of your previous work on inclusivity and exclusivity in relationship to Filipino and Filipino American identity, uh, particularly in terms of the nominative pronoun. Tayo uh, and the uh, genitive pronoun Kame. Mm. See, I listened to you. I remember <laughs> what you thought. Um, and I was wondering if you were to kind of combine some of the understanding and framework of exclusivity and inclusivity um, in terms of pronouns um, and personhood with Filipinos giving the, the eyebrow when they know another person is Filipino or. No, another person is in the inside of that group. Um, 
Are, does anything kind of immediately come to mind in relating it to these three different axes of gender and sexuality? Thanks. Now, I feel like I'm in a doctoral dis, uh, defense here. Um, yeah, um, actually, it's a, it's a good question because um, we're both um, sort of diasporic Filipino Americans. And so, um, uh, sort of as a personal statement, I've had to learn how to be Filipino. And if you are born in the Philippines, you don't have to, you just do it. So that I think uh, uh, diasporic Filipinos or any diasporic group is always much more self-conscious of the performativity of, of, of identity, in this case, of gender. And as good examples um, of that, uh, particularly with having to do with gender, uh, when I, I first went to the Philippines as, um, as a 20 year old, that the first time I had been in, uh, uh, there, all my uh, male relatives uh, who were glad to see me and they were happy that you know, the, the, the relative from America was here. When we would walk down the street, they would hold my hand. And uh, this has nothing uh, sexual, but as an American, I felt like funny and I kept trying to shake it off and uh, uh, because it, uh, it it means it's sort of in the American context, particularly uh, coming out of a high school background, it means you're 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 gay, and so nobody wants to be gay in high school. So that the, the idea of holding a, a man's hand was kind of like awkward. However, uh, with, as I began to understand um, more about the Philippines and the way in which things that I did in America. That didn't fit American things were actually very Filipino. I became more uh, comfortable with um, a sort of same-sex uh, physical contact. But as uh, Lorenzo points out, that in in the present uh, time, the idea of the inclusivity and exclusivity that is the the kami and tayo business means you sort of look at the person and say, are we uh, are we tayo? Are we together? Or are we kami? I'm here and you're here. And this is this, always this, this code switching, talking about holding hands, that, that um, in, in, even in Honolulu, I would never hold his hand because this has a different uh, meaning. When we were in the Philippines together and taking taxis, a couple of times we did hold hands and there's, there's nothing about it. There was nothing, sexual. I wasn't hitting on him. He wasn't hitting on me. And, and it was just because we were uh, close friends and, and it was a sort of a, an intimacy that it was not sexual. So these are the kinds of things that happen when we have to code switch. So a lot of times uh, when two Filipino Americans get together and we say, are we Filipino or are we American? Because you have to decide which, which gender behaviors you're going to do. And so that, and it also has to do with proximity, how close, even not touching, how close are we to each other? So that's one aspect of it. Uh, uh, another is uh, that uh, it, it's hard for, I think, non-Filipinos to sort of understand uh, in, in the American context, since we're talking about diasporic, is that uh, there are a number of, uh, 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 that is Filipinos coming from the Philippines, who are um, married, but very clearly effeminate. I mean, very effeminate. But in the Philippines, they're considered normal because they have kids. And, and, and the idea of being normal, normative in the Philippines is, is, is two generations. If you have children, you're normal. If you are married and you're straight, but you don't have kids, there's something wrong with you. So that the definition of what is normative uh, has, has different, um, uh, has, has, uh, is a different paradigm than it is so in America. And so I, um, I won't identify the couple, but there's a really very nice American anthropolo an anthropological couple, uh, they're anthropologists, who were in the Philippines, don't, don't want to have kids, will never have kids, and, the, um, uh, and they were in, in a village in Quezon. Oh, I should have said that. <laughs> Anyway, and, and, and so this, uh, uh, one of my friends came up to me and said, is something wrong with them? They don't have kids. And I, you know, I try to explain that in America, kids are kind of like an option. They're not, you know, <laughs> they're not a requirement. 
And, and, and his reaction to me or his response was not so much that it's good to have children, but that his response was, well, what do their parents say? Because it's important that you having kids uh, reifies your, your parents' generation, that they are the up or the grandchildren. So this whole thing of that lineage becomes very important, as I uh, mentioned in the paper. That's a too long an answer. I have a question, right? In the Hawaiian tradition, if you don't have a child, or even if you do, but you hanai someone, is that a practice that is acceptable within the Philippines? Social constructs. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, children are passed around, uh, mm -hmm. and I, again, I I, I I draw upon my own family background because again, when, when this happened in America before I went to the Philippines, I didn't quite understand this. But uh, my mother was the eldest of uh, eight children. Um, one of her sisters, I think she was the third down the line, was given to um, uh, her. Um, her parents to raise. So she was raised by this, the third sister was raised by grandparents, not by her parents. And that was kind of like the tide, you give one away because they need somebody. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the, this child who was, who was uh, part of the family was, was never in contact with the rest of the children. And that had all kinds of implications, which we didn't go into here, but uh, you know, she was the favorite child and the girl brought the spoil. Uh, so, so that, but this happens, but it's not quite the same as Hanai, in which then you inherit all the the, risk, the, the privileges and responsibilities of that family. You still belong to the original uh, sort of biological family. But also, the, I, 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 again, I wanted this talk to be about gender and not about sexuality, but in in um, uh, in the number of cases again, I'm drawing from my own family that um, that one of my aunts who was uh, partnered with another woman, they had a child uh, that they raised as though it was their child. Uh, and this was considered normative, even though there were two women. I, I thank you very much for all of this. I really don't know much about the Philippines except for the Kalinga area where I did my dissertation work. So I loved it that you had the nose flute. Um, all of the binaries go out the window. I mean, uh, people didn't really play nose flutes in the village I was in, but the, there was a guy who would sit and strum a guitar and everyone knew uh, that he was serenading someone. Yeah. Women told me, I worked with potters, that was my dissertation research was with women potters, um, especially with women who were in their 40s and 50s. Uh, and they said, Miriam, when you get to be 40, you'll start liking bitter things and that's when you have power. And what happened was the men still had a kind of authority, but the women could drop all of that pretense that you talked about in that first song. And they had a great deal of uh, autonomy. They could say whatever they liked and people had to listen to them. They were not ignored. Um, when it came to making decisions village to village, there was still a council of elders who were men, but they also had to listen to what their wives thought, right? So it. So the gender roles were kind of fluid, right? That when the women were young, when they were girls, they did behave in some of the ways you see in that song. And the guys were very macho, except with each other where they would hold hands uh -huh. and touch, but they were very macho. They were, but then once um, women had their kids and the kids were starting to grow and they went to menopause, at that point, those binaries really kind of went out the window. And that was interesting to me because it, it doesn't conform to anything I'd seen right. in the States. One of the best stories, and then I'll stop, but one of the best stories, the guy who's my husband now was my boyfriend then, and he's just very masculine looking and terribly hairy, and he's from Texas. <laughs> and anyway, so he showed up there and everyone was relieved finally because I was part of a student group, but they wanted to know where my husband was. So when he showed up, the guys were beyond themselves because they weren't gonna talk to me otherwise. And almost the first day, one of the most macho guys in the village who sat by my husband Jim and he just kept looking at Jim's chest he had a shirt on but he had it unbuttoned and finally Bug Lena just couldn't he just couldn't bear it any longer he just took his hand and he <laughs> shoved it down Jim's chest he said oh this was great and they were best friends after that but that didn't have anything to do with 
homosexuality. It was like Bagolina just thought he was cool. And he would <laughs> stroke his arm because his arms were hairy. And then he had a beard. People called him aiming on, which meant bearded guy. And so it was a very different construction of male friendship the night mm -hmm. scene. He would disappear. I in the morning they'd take him away so they could all smoke cigarettes and drink. And I just did my work, you know, because <laughs> they were so happy I brought the guy. That's also, I mean, to respond to that, that's also what I tried to uh, sort of end with, and that very much part of the of Filipino ness is this business of sensuality, of the yeah. touching, of the feeling. And, the, and again, you know, um, when in the Philippines, all our cousins, all the cousins, we all slept together, sure. like five to a bed. Yeah. And, and it was the idea of the touching. And I also, when I talk about uh, Filipinos to, to other Americans and, and how to understand them. I always point out to Honolulu at, at the airport, if you go to the you know late night of the midnight flights, uh, it used to be Philippine Airlines, all the Americans are sitting like five seats away. All the Filipinos are five of them sitting in two seats yeah. all together. And it's the idea of just touching all the time and all this, which is very common, particularly in, in stressful situations, you wanna be near somebody, whereas, uh, which I've never understood with Americans, so they always put their kids in a bassinet by themselves in a room, and you know, in 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 sort of in Philippines, everybody sleeps together, and particularly for little kids. And I, I, not to be too sort of bizarre, thing, but I think that's why there, there's fewer SIDS deaths in the Philippines than there are here because somebody's always around the kid. One of the things you said was really kind of. I don't know, it just kind of struck a chord with me when you said something about like homonormativity and heteronormativity are both normativity. Mm -hmm. And I think in modern day kind of discussion, um, we tend to see normativity as a negative. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what are the, what you see within the Philippines examples that you've laid out about the line between tradition, normativity, equity, like how do you make sense of, you know, for instance, somebody that doesn't align with any of these binaries mm -hmm. who's saying, look at Spain, they have on their, they have on their profile um, registration, a, uh, you get to choose your gender assigned gender at birth, and then you get to choose your gender identity. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Philippines, they're saying, look at Spain, our former colonizer. Mm -hmm. You know, how, where do you, how do you configure normativity in relationship to equity, mm -hmm. tradition, mm -hmm. gender identity? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I equate very closely normativity with tradition because both of them are areas in which you're, you find comfort. They're comfortable areas because normativity means that you know what to expect. And so, for example, if you walk into um, like a um, in, in, into a a party or a, a house that uh, of people you don't really know, you're always with somebody else. You know, if if you come in with a, with with a woman with a female, that immediately she will go into the kitchen and you will go into the garage. I mean, that you just know that, and that's very normative. Uh, and so, and that's comfortable. You know that. And even here in Hawaii, this is also very much part of that thing that, that the guys don't go into the kitchen. They go into, the, you know, outside and, and sit around and drink beer. So that, that's one aspect of, 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 of what normativity means. And that's also a tradition because uh, uh, the, the uh, Filipino society, public Filipino society is very homosocial, that all the men hang together and all the women hang together. There's a great movie that I showed him. I, I'm teaching my gender class, uh, gender in the performing arts of Asia this semester. And I showed this movie, it's called Sunflowers. If those of you haven't seen it, it's, it was done about 15 years ago now uh, of a community in Ilocos in which there's the Bakla beauty pageant. And one of the scenes it shows is a, one of these feminized males who is married, quote unquote, although not ceremonially married, to a man, a, a straight, Filipino male, and he hangs around with all the guys and acts just like a husband does, and, and then goes home to the uh, feminized male wife uh, when she, you know, to eat. But uh, he's not ostracized because 
his partner is um, uh, uh, is biologically a female because gender gender culturally gendered she is a female she does all the female stuff and and dresses as a female etc and so that that uh, the only sort of complication I guess is you know what do you do in bed but again in the Philippines you don't talk about that you just do it uh, so that it really doesn't have anything to do with anybody else of, you know as long as I'm not doing it to you you don't have to know what I'm doing so so that these are all the aspects I think of it and the machismo business uh, getting back to that is kind of like a uh, part of the, the colonized experience that um, if you if you look back to to early uh, uh, Spanish particularly missionary uh, accounts of the Philippines it's it's clear that the women had a lot of power both public and private and of course the whole business of the, the Babylon or shamanistic uh, spiritual um, uh, carriers were either women or these um, um, feminized males so so that there was power there and uh, even uh, today in modern Philippines uh, and uh, that uh, women are the ones who handle all the money in the family. The, the husband gives all the money to her and he gets an allowance. <laughs> now, in, a, in, in an American family, that isn't the way it happens, right? I mean, so the, the guy's in charge, the guy's in charge. I mean, this is the stereotype. So I, did I, I I'm, I'm still on, on point with your question. I think I am, yeah. So, so that the idea is that, that there is, uh, uh, sort of that that understanding of of, of where power is and where responsibility lies. Uh, we have questions okay. from the audience. Uh, this is taking you back to the music and the death. Mm -hmm. uh, while some are de de depicting social experience of gender relations, they can also manifest that which is not sanctioned by discourse. Speak. So, if this is a symbol of relationship, can you discuss how music and dance are possibly defining specific Filipino prescription of maleness and femaleness? What's the last part? How they are defining? How? So, can you discuss how music and dance are possibly defining specific Filipino prescriptions of maleness and femaleness? Mm. Yeah, well, actually, maybe both of us can sort of talk about it because I, I'm looking at sort of older and more traditional forms, and Lorenzo is the hip hop specialist, uh, and, which is also Filipino. I mean, this, I should also say that, that although my interests are really on sort of traditional stuff. I'm quite uh, aware that Filipino-ness, being Filipino, also concerns hip hop and, and, and many of the contemporary things which I'm physically not able to do. So the, he knows that. Uh, so he knows that, that, that aspect of, of Filipino music and dance. Um, I, I think that, uh, that in, in a number of traditional forms or their, re their reenactment of the in things like by Mihan, often the idea is that the women dance and the men play music. And so, and this is, is, is still very much part of sort of quote tradition. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is in some, some aspects. And certainly in, in, uh, um, in uh, the Cordillera, the, the mountain area that, uh, that Miriam was, was uh, describing, that uh, in dances, men and women dance together that it's simultaneously but not together yeah. so it, the, that is that uh, first of all the the, whip, the men play instruments as they dance uh, and also uh, much of the the the, uh, the dance movement is in a bent position that is very close to the earth and interestingly when the women dance when women dance they elevate their chests and hold out their arms so that there is a very, very distinct difference in not only body position, but also space uh, occupancy. How much space is being occupied and where is it? And so that it is quite clear that either you are male or female. Now, um, uh, again, the business of who decides whether you're male or female. And if you are a feminized male, uh, and see yourself as a female, you can dance 
as a female, but they have to wear female clothes. And this, this is both in the South, that is uh, in the, the Muslim part of the Philippines and in the Cordillera, and also certainly in, in the lowland area, which everybody talks about. So that the, the, like, uh, uh, I guess one of the big controversies, I guess this year was that the, the mayor of Marikina, no, no, it was, I guess it was the, 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 the Cardinal, said that the, the feminized males couldn't march, be in the same procession, and, uh, in the same Santa Cruz and possession, uh, procession as uh, the biologically uh, uh, sexed females. And so they had to have their own parade. And they were, I guess, a bit more, better attended than the, the other. <laughs> But, but so that the, so that there there is some <clears throat> interaction of this kind, and I think it has to do with globalization again, because priests before tolerate, I and mean, you you didn't say you, that they could do it, but you didn't say they couldn't do it. But now there's more of this. The the hard edges of globalization are upon us. So this idea of are you hem, uh, are you homosexual or are you heterosexual, you have to make a choice, and I and. <clears throat> If you sort of like read the work of, uh, I guess, Martin and those guys who are uh, looking at diasporic Filipinos, a lot of, well, I don't know what you would call them, um, uh, males who are somewhat effeminate but are not full on bakla. When they come to America, they have to choose are you going to be, you know, are you going to be uh, 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 homosexual or are you going to be heterosexual? Are you going to be straight? Are you going to be gay? So those are the only choices you've got. So, so that that it sort of tips. Whereas in the Philippines, there's this nice sort of fluidity of where you go, and uh, as uh, uh, and, and what you do. But again, as I said, this talk is not about um, um, uh, sexuality; it's about gender. But you do want to say something about? Uh, um, yeah, gender I mean, there's, and so many ways, there's so many ways to answer hip-hop. that. I think, yeah. like one thing that remi- that I remember. Um, as I was doing my field work and talking about asking about gender um, and really trying to get to um, how do women in a masculine dominated space like hip hop navigate um, gender inequality. There are so many dimensions about like the administrative labor versus the choreographic work versus the the body. Um, One thing that I thought was really striking was like looking at the historical choreography and the movement of the body um, you cannot get away from shoulder-centered movement correlating with masculine presenting bodies mm-hmm. and hip-centered movement. Or some interviewee said more flexibility and um, rotational um, movement in the lower back correlating with feminine presenting bodies. Um, and then you can also talk about costume and facial relationship and all women or all men groups, but there's so many kind of aspects to it that you know there should be multiple books written. Yeah. But that was just in street dance. But if you think about Gary V, you know, what movements was he using when he was sort of the man of the 90s, you know? Um, who were sort of these ideals of femininity or ideals of masculinity? And I think those those always point to then. Not just one's like selfhood or casarian, mm-hmm. but like the Filipino is always made in relationship to the non Filipino, right? So the Filipino ness of these Bayanihan dancers to the Korean audience that they were performing Maglalate, which makes me think, oh, that's why they had the shirts on, you know, instead of showing their bare chest, you know. So thinking about that Filipino ness is always constructed in, in relationship to another can also get us to Filipino ideologies like, like. Ah, or like Kapwa. Um, so things that are not even, that are a little bit more philosophical or psychological, but rooted in Filipino epistemology. Do you want audience want to speak directly? Uh, yeah. You want, I think you want one? You can ask, you can ask directly. Hi, Rick. Oh, how is it? How's it? Um, thank you for the insightful talk and discussion. And my question is uh, really regarding the... In- Hello. Yeah. Hello. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. 
Oh, Juan. Oh, Juan. Oh, sorry. I don't, we can't tell who it is. Okay. Hi, Juan. Can you hear me? Sorry, go ahead. Um, thank you for the talk. And my question is really regarding the impact of colonialism, globalization, and modernization, as well as the influence, um, the, the Western influence notion of gender and sexuality. And I think you briefly answered my question, but in terms of uh, fluidity and relationality, I was hoping if you can further elaborate on this topic. And specifically, I'm interested in how, you know, the mechanism of code switching between Western and indigenous notion of gender and how it is how it is how it is expressed in music and dance and how individuals react to these changes thank you okay. uh, first of all it, it's the, the code switching is not just between western and and filipino in the philippines i think i mean my take is that it, there's also code switching between the metropole and the rural area and it, it's the same thing it, and how you gender yourself or how you perform gender is depending on who you think is watching. And so when I'm in Manila, um, among particularly at, at UP, among the, oh, even worse, the Ateneo, um, <laughs> among, you know, my, my sort of, I guess you would say my intellectual peers, that group, <clears throat> I'm very aware that, that I sort of act, uh, that my gendering is, is much more, I guess, formal and a little bit more American, because when I'm in, in the provinces um, with with uh, uh, with uh, friends who are not uh, uh, sort of in universities, but uh, don't from from either doing field research or now I have a, a really nice network of of, of, uh, of Filipino friends who were part of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival in 1998 when the Philippines was featured. And these are all mostly rural people. And there you act differently and, 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 and you gender differently. And there, you know, I'm very comfortable with, with like uh, one of the boys, the younger boys, teenage sitting on my lap. And that is, is okay. I mean, I, I don't think I would do that in Manila, but there, because everybody understands what that means. It really means nothing. So, so that uh, there are our gender behaviors and, and the, also the business of, of um, um, uh, I guess, things like hospitality, what you bring and, and when you leave, all those kinds of things are different in the, in the rural area and in the urban area. Uh, <clears throat> in the urban area, for example, you know that everybody gets start looking around around 11 o'clock at night because they got to work the next day. In the rural area, party goes on for two or three days and nobody, you know, just go to sleep and you come back. And, and, um, it, and it, it's a very different kind of um, managing of gender, but certainly of time and all those kinds of things that I think are, that, that are, you know, that are the part of that, that aspect. There is the one question from Garrett Ken. Oh, hi Garrett. <laughs> directly, but no response. So, this is the question. Very informative, Rick. The hormonal aspect still connect the Philippines with most of Southeast Asia, especially how heroic mythological characters are unlike the hyper masculine Indian prototype. Mm -hmm. This also show a close relationship to Chinese opera roles with effeminate or androgynous hero, heroes. So the question is, how much do you think this homonormative aspect in the Philippines and across Southeast Asia might also be influenced by Chinese tradition? Um, yeah, I, I, I would, I guess, uh, reformulate the statement and say that Chinese, Southeast Asia, and even I, I guess uh, parts of East Asia, uh, other parts of East Asia share homonormativity, whether or not where it came from, I'm, you know, I've, I'm a little bit loath to say it came from China. Uh, uh, I mean, that, 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 that it was something that was copied from China, because I, I think that homonormativity, if you look at hunters and gatherers in general, 
uh, has to do with survival of all kinds. And the fact that, that if you're going to have a, a, um, a, your, your, your family or your, 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 your social group survive, you have to produce children. And so then you have to protect women uh, because they are the only ones who can produce children. And so that, that whole, whole business of continuity, I think, is, is an important aspect. And whether uh, continuity was not uh, sort of invented by Chinese or was not taught by Chinese to everybody else, it's something that I think is very sort of biological, maybe just human. So I would agree that, that the homonormativity is very uh, much uh, a kind of a modus in, in, in Asia, particularly in East Asia and Southeast Asia. But I don't see it as uh, sort of originating in one place. But it's interesting. I mean, uh, uh, Garrett mentioned the, the whole business of of of, uh, of fluidity of, of gendering in, in in theater tradition, like Chinese opera and things like that. And I think that's very, uh, 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 I guess, a, a very important aspect of my contention that <clears throat> all these three pairs of things are quite independent one from the other. That is that if you are a female and you play a male role, that doesn't have to mean that you are either a lesbian or that you like other women, you just play that role. But it is also possible that you do, that, that everything is possible, it's very fluid. And so, so that the, the idea is that, uh, that there, are, there are fewer sharp edges in categories um, in what I'm calling traditional Asia, um, particularly, uh, let me say just the Philippines, so I don't try to speak for everybody, uh, uh, than there are in, say, in North Atlantic societies. Oh, yes. Here's another question. Uh, LGBT plus community in Southeast Asia today seems to breaking norm and have more space, both physically and virtually, to perform and express, it, then express themselves than in the past. The question is, how does the deep indigenous sensibility uncover in three binary analytical framework that you described apply to younger Filipina or Filipino who may not be aware of past normativity? <laughs> We have to ask them. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, my contention is that 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 even older Filipinos are not aware of these pairs. I mean, this is this is a, an analytic construct that 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 I, I think is useful once we use it as a tool. But these are not things that people either talk about or maybe even are aware of. And again, my contention is that it is not that we're privileged, but as Filipino Americans who have been outside the Philippines and don't automatically perform Filipinicity, we've had to learn or understand how these things work. And that's why I came up with these, uh, these, these categories. I think uh, uh, one of the things that I'm always sort of have reservations about uh, with academe is that unfortunately, the natives will read what we say and then they'll become aware of what they're doing rather than just simply performing it. And I'm not talking about just keeping them innocent, but it's just that it changes. Once you name something, it changes how you do it. And, and so that, that, that you know, uh, we, we all do certain things, but once you, you've got the name for it, then it, it, um, it objectifies it a, a, a lot more than, than Otherwise, so that the idea of okay now I'm being Filipino uh, is something that Filipinos don't have to do, but those of us who you know are transnational or or or, or hyphenated Filipinos, we do this all the time. We you know am I Filipino enough, or am I you know, or am I too Filipino? Because that also happens too that you overcompensate and then they say. Hey, don't act already. This is, you know, we know you're American. <laughs> and so the great, like, still, again, a, a, a kind of a personal story about this, the great lovely experience of when my relatives think I'm acting too Filipino, you know, trying to overdo it, is that they speak to me in Tagalog. <laughs> because my Tagalog is what I call Tarzan Tagalog. I can, you know, I can do it, 
but with an American act, I can't do the Filipino accent. And, and so they all sort of sit around and smile and, and, <laughs> as, as I'm speaking. And the other aspect of this is that if you are with it, like young people, like in Manila, you don't really speak pure Tagalog, you speak this Taglish. And I never know when you're gonna switch, you know, when do you go back from English to a Tagalog word? And uh, there's, there's appears to be a rule for that, but I don't know what it is, because I always do it at the wrong time. And he's, oh, you know, oh, he's going to <laughs> anyway. So, so, so yeah, that's uh, part of, uh, I think, uh, um, my reservation about even talking about it like this to other Filipinos is that they become aware that there's a label, there's not a label for this thing. Okay, we have um, one question, maybe two. Huh? One, two more questions. <laughs> of Dayao, the documentary in the Philippines, huh. where the quote quotes fit and intensity of execution of the dance Magla Latik yeah. mm -hmm. uh, was ramped up by choreographer to add excitement to make it more difficult and more modern. That that may also be offer me heteronormative spaces in performance in performances and through disciplining the body question is uh is oh, oh, okay i wonder if such approach of say filling up the music the music is also normalized in the composition of folk dance music for all male folk dance like magra Glatic, through Rondala or its performances? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, virtuosity and speed um, um, is, uh, I think, fairly universal. And, mm -hmm. and, and that is uh, that there, when, with Magdalatik, as, as an example, there are, I guess, normative, regular ways of doing it when you're doing it for entertainment of this. this uh, Tayo variety, there's just us. And you don't have to go fast. But if you're going to put it on stage for what we call the kami, that is, we're performing for you, then uh, a lot of times you have to you have to, to do something that will make the audience uh, react in a way that you want them to react because you want their approval. And uh, a lot of times this has to do with speed because people can understand speed and skill. They can't. I shouldn't say that. They often don't understand subtle nuance. So, like with Maglalatik, for example, there's um, a, a various movements. I mean, the movements around fix you can do things. Well, the, the, the one where uh, that uh, one guy can hit the, the, the shells on the back here. And uh, the, the idea is it has to do with your mother pinching your butt, you know. <laughs> But you don't, you know, you don't understand that. I mean, people don't understand it's, it's a joke because there's a lot of, I guess, same sex pinching of butts in, in, among friends in the Philippines, which again, it's not sexual, it's just, you know, like teasing stuff. And, and, and so the, the, when you do that, it, people would pick that up, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, an American or a Korean audience would have no idea why, why, why that's really funny. And so the, the, the some nuances, you have to abandon, you have to go for the big, the big gesture to get anything done. And so even like the, the dance, um, uh, the, the uh, tinnickling, the bamboo dance, it was supposed to be a graceful dance, showing, you know, how you can move through these things and, 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 and not look harried. But now, you know, it, particularly at the end of the dance, when, when they double time it, uh, uh, like the girl's hair is bouncing up and down and, and, all this, and she looks very unfeminine. And the idea is that you're supposed to look completely, unfem uh, completely feminine and un uh, unconcerned as your feet are you know, going through this thing. And so it's sort of changed kind of like the, the aesthetic. But it's still, it's still technically and still not uh, but it's a, a kind of a, another version.
and uh, getting back to, uh, to uh, uh, sort of what Garrett has talked about in a lot of, uh, you get Cam and he's in Bali now, talks about in a lot of his work that there are, there are two kinds of traditional ways of doing ketchup, this monkey business. One is for the tourists in which you're spectacular and one is for ritual in which everybody already knows what's supposed to be, be happening. And I think this also, this and this is what Lorenzo was talking about, this kamitayo, the inclusive and exclusive. If it's inclusive, we all know what's going on. So you don't have to be spectacular. You just have to be clever or funny or pleasing. But if you're, you're working for an audience that doesn't know anything about Filipino culture or doesn't look for nuance, you have to, you know, sort of be in their face. And how do you do that by the big gesture or doing that kind of thing? And I think there's a couple of things that also inform maybe, maybe unconsciously the decision to speed up things. One is the neoliberal capitalism and the development of modifying our practices. We're no longer in a space like maybe like, I mean, we're thinking about Mary Monarch right now and thinking about the difference between something in a competitive modality versus a ritual without, you know, without competition. We can think about that and also at the same time think about um, like how precise something has to be. So precision, attention to detail, these kinds of details that are maybe less important when you're um, actually like focusing more on cultural revitalization in the wake of colonialism and more and, and the speed attention like precision are more of that like modified version of it rather than it's a gift to or it's a prayer or it's a, a an offering um and so I think yeah, a lot of context really determines some of these details. But this, this still doesn't take away from its Filipinoness. Yeah. But what it does is it, it sort of changes the paradigm a bit. But it's still Filipino. Yeah. Oh, just quickly. Last summer, the Georgia Tech uh, Filipino group ensemble did to Nickling that went viral. Did did you see that? And, oh, okay. That was amazing. Okay. No more questions. This is our last question. No more. No more questions. Okay. Uh, there is a question. But there are many questions actually still there, but we only have limited time. So I'm sorry for those who will not get the answer for the question. So this is very short, but really get a long explanation. Like, given the Given the fluidity of gender implications, your exam should we this the binary as a theoretical foundation? That's all. <laughs> oh, no, that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Should we this the binary as a theoretical foundation? Yeah, mm -hmm. ditch it. Should we ditch it? Uh, no. <laughs> We should, but we should need to qualify it. I mean, I think by my I my, but my example of uh, of of. Uh, Homonormativity within heteronormativity shows that the, the the binaries are still useful, but they're not absolutes. Uh, because and 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 the whole business of of uh, I make a distinction between identity and identification. That, that identity is what other people see with you, and, and maybe that's what they call you. Identification is what you see for yourself. I think both the, the, the inner and the outer has to be there. And so you need to have some kind of a binary. But the interesting thing, again, another whole topic is in Philippine languages and many Southeast Asian languages, the pronouns are one, two, and many. And so this two-ness, uh, I think, is an important aspect of how people who we all think in language, what this means that there still is a binary, but it's not the absolute. You know what I mean? So that. Well, thank you very much then for your talk today. Thanks both to Rick and also to Lorenzo for <laughs> for speaking to us. Obviously, a lot of us were really interested by the topic, and we hope that we'll have a chance to 
talk some more about it in the future. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's been listening to us online. We're really happy to have you as part of our community. Bye-bye. We try to reach you by telephone and